Thank you very much for inviting me due to a meeting that I had with uh, Rector Christian Arthur van Geusau in the Netherlands. There was a more political situation there. Uh, there was the icon of the Holy Family that was installed in uh, one of the parliament uh, rooms. And because I have know some parliamentarians, and they asked me to celebrate Mass in the parliament. Well, that was a little bit complicated, but we have a Catholic church in the neighborhood and we celebrated Mass. And when the emeritus bishop carried the icon into the parliament. Uh, well, this uh, church and state uh, question that I will not uh, discuss today, um, but we'll, I've discussed effective synodality. So I'm much more discussing something within the church that, ha that has relation with the society, of course, uh, but um, we will be really addressing something from canon law. I was desperately looking for a canon lawyer in your staff, but uh, well, it's, uh, well, I mean, uh, so I hope I will not be too much a kind of lawyer tonight, but uh, well, yeah, you can have every, any question that you want afterwards. Um, so it's about church administration, a defying challenge for the administration of the Catholic Church. And I will start with a little example. The example is that a diocesan bishop has taken a decision to close his cathedral church, primarily because of financial reasons. This cathedral, built in the 16th century, has also the function of a parish and is property of the parochial situation, the, the, the canonical parish, and is also recognized in civil law as a juridical person. The Dutch civil law recognizes canon law as the internal uh, juridical order of the Catholic Church. The parish has several buildings, and this is one of them, and the cathedral is also classified as a national monument. Well, the bishop took his decision, but it was confronted with a lot of resistance. That's not always the case in the Netherlands. I know you have your prejudices about the Netherlands, but there are some situations that people listen to bishops, but not in this case. <laughs> um, parishioners expressed their disagreement, and finally the bishop withdrew his decision, leaving the parish with the task to find sufficient finances and to make also pastoral plan to keep this cathedral a lively and financial healthy community. And in the meantime, also the Apostolic See, Rome, made clear it would not give the necessary permission to change the Episcopal See. So I will not talk about church politics, but I will church, spoke about church administration. This is a very interesting case because it is very complex. Church governance is not just making decisions of ecclesiastical authorities. It involves several juridical persons and also the faithful of the parish, of the community, and also we should not forget the municipality and the public authorities. In this situation, at least three decisions have to be made and the competence of three different juridical persons. So first of all, the decision to withdraw a church from liturgical use, to bring it, as can lawyers say, to a profane but not unworthy use. That's the decision of the diocesan bishop. He can make a decree, but he has to ask the opinion of the presbyteral council, the priests in his diocese and also those who enjoy legitimate rights on the building, and that is the parish. The decision cannot be taken without serious investigation and consultation. That's the first step. The second step is to change the Episcopal See of the diocese, because if you close your, your church, your cathedral, you have to find another church to be, become your cathedral, your, your cathedral, your episcopal see, and that's something not to be decided by the bishop, by, but by the Congregation for Bishops in Rome. 
The third decision is the alienation of the property. You can sell it. So the owner can sell this, this building, and it's the parish who is the owner of the building. They can sell it, and there was someone who wanted to sell it. It was the, the, the museum next door. They want to buy the building. But, um, and the per parish needs also the consent of the bishop. Of course, it was clear. But um, because of the, the resistance of the parishioners and also the resistance of the apostolic see, finally the bishop could not execute his wish in his decision. But also maybe the municipality did not agree on the change of the use of this building. In this complex situation, different actors have to proceed prudently and wisely. And I think my thesis tonight that the canonical legislation is not sufficiently equipped to lead these procedures. So how to act, how to proceed. So first, what happened with canon law and the church and theology? Uh, what did we see the last decades? As you probably all know, the fundamental renewal in ecclesiology since the Second Vatican Council is the shift from an institutional approach to the concept of the church as communion. Should not be new to you. The people of God, a rediscovered but old image of the church, already found with the church fathers, means that the church is understood henceforward as a communion of faithful with the ordained ministry as leadership. This leadership is understood as service on the sacramental foundation of the church. This can be found in all levels of the church, in parishes, in religious institutes, dioceses, and even the Catholic church herself. She is not an institution, she is a community. The essential juridical persons in the church are communities. Well, it might look very clear and obvious, but it's not when you consider the perfect, perfecta uh, societas doctrine of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, the, the church was institutional. That was the essential property of the Catholic Church, a society, an institution. But the Council Fathers of Vatican II formulated a proper theological concept for the church. And the institutional aspect, it was not abolished, but it came, became just a helping instrument, a helpful instrument to safeguard the concrete life of ecclesiastical communities. But it really meant a diminishing importance for this jurisdictional and institutional approach. And it led to a crisis in canon law. The question was raised whether the Catholic Church was still in need for such a discipline. In spite of our honorable history and numerous scholars throughout the ages, many thought the Catholic Church could do without canon law. She could refer simply, as Protestant churches do, to civil law, with some minor interior ordinations that would be enough. The Protestant churches do it, and they are happy with it. They don't have their own canon law. So this crisis in canon law occurred after the Vatican II Council. But the aggiornamento project of John XXIII became into full realization with the promulgation of the Code of Canon Law. I hope you know the book. Yeah, you have seen it, in spite of the absence of real canon law here. Okay, that's the book. Um, but it became a success. In spite of the anti-legalistic, anti-nominian attitude in the period of the Council, the Code can be considered as a successful implementation of the doctrine of Vatican II. Maybe the Code is not perfect, and indeed successive pontiffs have already modified a number of canons, and it's still going on, but the Code has proven to be effective throughout the Catholic Church. But maybe not enough.
I have to use this one, this is easier. <laughs> so there's next step, the next step to be made from communion to synodality. So the Con Synod of Bishops in 1985 this really evaluated the Second Vatican Council and said, well, communio is the real, the key concept of the Vatican II Council. If you want to, to understand the doctrine of the Council, you must use the word, the concept of communio. So 20 years later, after the Council, it was more clear than during the Council itself. Ever since, this concept has been discussed and worked out in detail. But with Pope Francis, the key concept to be developed is synodality. He doesn't abandon communio, not at all, but to go a step further, to take all the current consequences of communio, he refers to the concept that has now to be developed is synodality. Also, like people of God, communio, synodality is not a new concept. It is from the ancient history of the church where synods and councils were already playing an essential role in the development of the church, in her doctrine and in her discipline. As the Belgian canon lawyer, Alphonse Bourras, the French-speaking canon lawyer in Louvain, La Neuve, he states in a recent article, synodality belongs to the DNA of the Catholic Church. It is a constitutive and structural element in the church. Whereas in the pre-conciliar era, the monarchical approach of church government was dominant, the renewal of the doctrine of the church with communio demands a new governance approach as well. And for Pope Francis, the instrument par excellence is the Synod of Bishops. The Synod of Bishops was instituted by Pope Paul VI in 1965, um, and he put it into practice. And in his six and a half years of his pontificate from Pope Francis, already organized four synods. Um, and like Pope Benedict also had four synods, but he had eight years of his pontificate. Um, and we have seen that Pope Francis introduced procedures of consultations in the preparation for the Synod. And these consultation procedures have become a formal part of the whole organization of a Synod. The Pope published his motu proprio Ecclesia um, Episcopalis Communio, and in this he writes about the, the formal part of the Synod is the preparation with the people of God. But it's not only that that's on the universal level, but also on the level of the particular church, the, the diocese, uh, and their groupings, the bishops' conferences, church provinces. Synodality can be developed. Particular councils, diocesan synods, and also diocesan councils provided by the Code of Canon Law. And in several countries, we see now, quite recently, some new developments. The French bishops this month invited lay people to participate in their meeting, the annual meeting of the bishops' conference. That's for the first time. It was always the bishops together, they were discussing. But now, this year, for the first time, the bishops of France invited lay people to participate. And also, you must be aware of the German bishops with the synodal way. Well, we not exactly know what the status of this synodal way is yet, but these are valuable experiences and experiments. We will see what happens. Why is this important? Because we have seen deficient governance in the church. I hope you will recognize it. So, with the recent crisis in the church, we must be happy with canon law. I hope you understand it. That's one of my reasons to be here. Huh? Um, it's an instrument to serve the necessary change 
reform of the church is always necessary. Ecclesia semper reformanda, and therefore we need not only theologians, of course, and moral theologians and everybody, but also canon lawyers. I hope I need not to explain where ecclesiastical governance has shown itself insufficient. It is, of course, the way ecclesiastical authorities have dealt with crisis situations in the church, responded how they respond to allegations of sexual abuse, but also situations of parish organizations, reorganizations, the closure of churches, cathedrals, and also the administration of church property. And the apostolic signature, this is the highest tribunal in Rome to deal with all kinds of juridical and also judicial cases, the highest appeal court in the church, it has to deal with a growing number of appeal cases against Episcopal acts of administration. Even lay people, but also clerics, they go to the tribunal because they do not agree with the decision of their bishop. But also not only from within the church, also from outside of the church, there's an assessment of church government by exterior parties that criticize the way Catholic leaders have dealt with issues. There are royal and parliamentary commissions, the famous one, of course, in Australia, but we have seen such a thing also in the Netherlands and in France and in other countries. And also we've seen the reaction in the United States of the public uh, prosecutor. Um, they have imposed on the Catholic Church to be more accountable for her actions. And sometimes even an investigation has, has been imposed by public authorities. This demanded church authorities to allow more self-criticism and receive critical feedback from others outside of the church. And this also has reached the Vatican. Like Cardinal Di Nardo said this month when he was relieved of office as president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, he said, I quote, Pope Francis ushered the church in a new era of bishop accountability with a worldwide standard for investigating wrongdoing." End of quote. So the result of this change is not a nice one. Cardinals are incarcerated or under public penal investigation. The Yassin bishops have been removed from office and even cardinal bishops and priests have lost the clerical status. And not only because the church herself did this investigation, she was forced to do it also by the exterior parties. Ecclesiastical authorities can no longer withdraw themselves from public critical analysis. There might be a problem, but it is the consequence of Gaudium et Spes. You know Gaudium et Spes. What does Gaudium et Spes says, say? We are part of the society. We are not separate. We are not apart from the modern society. This does not mean that the Catholic Church must adopt everything of modern society. Of course not. The principle of religious freedom can protect her against direct state intervention. But it does not mean that the Church should not respond to modern and everyday secular principles of modern standards of governance. Of course, in former days, when you were criticizing a diocesan bishop or the Roman pontiff, you would have really have a problem. But we have Canon 212 in the Code of Canon Law talking about the right and even the obligation to express your opinion. How can we find a good balance between expressing your opinion and to express your needs, and on the other hand, um, criticizing the bishop, well, where can you find a good middle? It's also a job for canon lawyers. So if you want to have a job as a canon lawyer, you know what to do. But OK. OK, this one. Um, what about governance in the church?
So canon law supports a strong leadership in the church. The canonical tradition has always demonstrated its flexibility to adapt itself to new circumstances. The development of ecclesiastical offices, like the Roman pontiff, like the diocesan bishop, like the parish priest, they always have been influenced by its context. And the papacy itself has shown a remarkable flexibility when you consider historical circumstances with or without the emperor. You know, the emperor in the first eras had a very important uh, place. He's, he even invited for councils. But also without the emperor, the pope could do his job. With or without the support of the papal states. You know, the papal states from 800 to 1870, almost 1,000 years, the pope had his country. But also without these papal states, the Pope has survived since 1870. But also with or without the support of ecumenical councils. After Trent, there have only been two councils. And the First Vatican Council in 1870 spoke about the infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. So why do we need a council? So the Pope, the papacy has adapted itself to new requirements of leadership. I can speak of the parish priest, but I'm looking at my time. So, but also there is something flexible going on. It adapts itself within the framework of the doctrine to modern standards, modern situations. The now discussion in the Amazon, I will not go in there, but it's a very clear uh, moment of possible adaption. We will see how far it goes. Um, so the Cetus perfected doctrine of the 19th century supported the church to survive in competition with the nation states of the 19th century. But Vatican II has abandoned this, this um, model but we still see that the consequences of this Vatican II Council, the Council, Ecumenical Council, about the episcopacy has not been taken over yet. So now a new modification in church leadership is necessary for its quality and effectiveness. As in the old days of canon law, scholars can be inspired by modern governance principles and approaches. I will discuss some of them tonight. Well, what are the challenges? I have about 14 slides, so we are going, going quite well. You're falling asleep, no? Yes, nobody falls asleep, okay. Okay, um, the challenges. The issue is whether the leadership in the Catholic Church, the Roman Pontiff, the College of Bishops and the Diocesan Bishops is capable to overcome the issues that have occurred in recent history. The sexual abuse crisis and the way it was handled in the first decades of this crisis shocked Catholics and non-Catholics alike. But there's also the mismanagement of the Vatican finances and the necessary nomination of capable auditors and the reorganization of the administration of the Apostolic See finances. We have seen last week the nomination of the new prefect for the Vatican Secretariat for Economics. It has been vacant for two years, and now the Pope wants to have a new person in head of, in the, as head of this dicastery, not a bishop for the first time ever. Um, so there has to be a response to the problems. In the old days, the response was to to get things done in the, just in the, our interior. We solve it ourselves. Don't discuss it in public. We keep it to ourselves. That was the normal way to do. It was not a bad way. It was a custom in that time. But now, now we consider this as a deficient system of governance. And I'm afraid that the majority of authorities did not understand that the scene of the church and society had changed fundamentally and that this required a new approach in governance. After the post-conciliar optimistic period, 
that considered no need for canon law. You remember what I said? Uh, we know now that even with the two codes of canon law, we have the code of the Latin Church and also the code of the Oriental Churches, and the constitution of pastor bonus on the Roman Curia, they are not efficient enough. We've seen a lot of new legislation, one already under John Paul II, the Motu Proprio Sacramentorum Sanctitatis Tutela, SST, you, that rearranges the authority of the diocesan bishops. The Roman Curia says, we will discuss and judge issues that are too severe and too complex. You cannot handle it in your local situation. And also, it forces diocesan bishops to go to the civil authorities. So it was a very big step to rearrange the diocesan, the, the authority of the diocesan bishop. But also, Pope Francis issued a lot of motu proprio letters uh, changing the administration of the church. And the, one of the last ones in the motu proprio vos estis lux mundi, you are the light of the world. The obstruction of civil law investigation is punished severely. If a bishop refuses to go to the civil authorities, he might have a problem. And I quote the commentary of a Dutch penal law, uh, law uh, just a Dutch penal law judge. He was, he's a Catholic. The Pope recognizes here fundamentally the applicability of civil law in ecclesiastical matters. So this is a very principal point of view that the Pope takes. He's not the first one. It is well prepared by John Paul II in the last years of his pontificate and by Pope Benedict. But it's in these motu proprio letters, the last years of Pope Francis, it is clear. But the question is, can the leadership in the church reorganize itself? So, okay. Um, so, no, it's not one. Okay, I forgot one. How to organize a counter power in the church. So, what is lacking? You know the trias politica? You have heard of it? Trias politica system? So, the, the, it's a Montesquieu thing in civil law. You have power and contra power. You should not have just power. You should have someone else also have power. Um, in the Catholic Church, this trias politica system cannot be executed because of the unity of the episcopal power, because the bishop is acting in the name of Christ, and in him, Christ, there can be only unity. So there can be no power and contra power in one person, in one office. But that creates a lack of accountability, because the bishop does not have any contra power, counter power against him. So, but canon law has the possibilities to organize this counter power, um, not to jeopardize the, uh, the offices and governance in the church, but to strengthen it and to have it better embedded in canon law. So now I go to this one. Um, it's not only about the Catholic Church. There's a lead crisis in leadership also how many minutes I have. Well, I don't go far, too far in this, um, but we see a lot of demonstrations. We lead, see people that are unhappy with the way even democratic societies are functioning. There's also um, the mass media is playing a part. So the bottom, top down and the bottom up um, uh, paradigm is not working anymore. There should be another approach. And we come here um, from the last point, so I, from the periphery, periphery to the heart. So what also civil law administrators understand, we have to deal with in what is living in society and we have to bring that to the heart. So we will have to listen to the periphery. And when you talk about these periphery and heart, you come to what Pope Francis is speaking about. The periphery, when it involves rights, you create a process of shared decision-making and taking. 
When in the periphery we can find the inspiration to enlighten and enrich the heart and the whole Catholic community of the church. There you find your inspiration, and if you can involve the periphery, then you will enrich the heart of the community. It's for society, and it's the same for the church. So I have four elements for effective synodality. First of all, trust in the people of God. So we had in the 13th century a bulla of Boniface VIII saying that lay people are in a high degree hostile to the clergy, the bulla clericis laicos. And they sometimes still think that is the truth in the church. But if you, if you consider infallibility, that's also not just a gift for the Roman pontiff, it's also a gift to the church. When you read Vatican I and Vatican II. But also church governance and diocesan bishops needs there is to be a unity of the shepherds and the flock. Already in September 2013, Pope Francis explains that sometimes the shepherds have to be behind the flock, sometimes in front of them and sometimes in the middle. Not to follow the flock when they are behind and do whatever the flock wants, no, to make sure that everybody is still there together, that the whole flock remains together. But if they trust the people of God, if really there's trust in the people of God, they have to involve them, also in the Episcopal nominations. The next step is to liberate the diocesan bishop out of his ivory tower of Episcopal governance. But you need to trust the people that you work with. If you consider them as your enemies, if you consider them as well, it's very difficult to talk with them, they don't know anything, well, then you, this will not work. The second step, of course, is consultation and consensus. You remember, I hope, in Pope, when Pope Francis entered the balcony in 2013, in March, he said, we are, we'll be traveling together, bishop and people, and it started, his pontificate started with, you remember, the prayer of the people. They prayed for him, the newly elected bishop of Rome. Since then, the pontiff has introduced methods of consultation. But consultation does not mean having all the opinions and have a debate about opinions. Already John Henry Newman in 1859 wrote that it's not just about having opinions, but it's about the essence of the church, about the definition of the church. Uh, consulting the faithful means that the fidelium sensus is a branch of evidence which is natural and necessary. This provides a broader support by the people. It's not just a democratic technique to have more votes, but it's about the quality of decision making. Without leaving out the people of God is unwise. Newman would call it unfoolish. You remember maybe what he said about a church without lay people. It was a foolish idea. All who are concerned want to be involved. So it's not about the counting of the votes, but it is about the consensus. Also in the Vatican II Council, so you see how many votes there were for the documents. It's only a tiny minority that were not agreeing. Also, the final document of the Amazon, you can see the number of votes. 85% of the Council Fathers, of the Synodal Fathers, did agree on the last chapters of the, the final document. Even more in the first chapters, but these were not so very. The last one is the most important thing. So, but the thing is how to deal with disagreement, how to deal with, a ship, with, with sheep that have a different voice. And they, how can the shepherds accept sheep vocalizing their beliefs differently? But that's a new issue. Collegial government. We have this, in canon law, this very specific distinction between affective and effective collegiality. Many canon lawyers and church authorities prefer to speak about affective collegiality. We're so happy together. 
and in Apostolo Suos, the motor proprio of John Paul II on Episcopal Conferences, this is the phrase. But it is too weak. Bishops can opt out. You have a number of bishops, the majority wants to do something, and then one of them or two of them are opting out. So if you continue to work with affective collegiality, it will not work. So I think in the statutes of Episcopal conferences and also in pontifical legislation, the number of issues that have to be decided by Episcopal conferences should be increased. Then the last of my principles is more a civil law one about transparency and accountability. They are the fundamental elements in church, in secular society about governance, and the Catholic Church cannot ignore it because they are looking at how bishops are taking, doing their job. It is about the presidency of councils. Now, in many councils of the church, in the diocese, the bishop is the president. But I think if you really want to have uh, a accountable situation, then you leave your presidency to the lay people or to the members of the council, and then you can have a free and open discussion, and then you can respond as the president in a second moment. The same can be done on the level of the church in a nation, like the German Central Committee des Deutschen Katholiken, that could function also like that, and maybe also on the universal level. Cardinal Arborelius from Sweden, he has proposed a universal committee of women consultants for the Roman pontiff. I don't know whether this means that he speaks of female cardinals, I don't know, but uh, in canon law, everything is possible. Well, I see some faces that would not approve of this idea, but it can be possible. But it needs some more accountability but also about finances, who is controlling it. I remember when as a parish priest, I in introduced, according to diocesan standards, the four I principle, people said to me, why don't you trust us? I said, nobody will touch on his own or her own the church collections and no church accounts just by, by one person. Always a second person be present, also second person to look in them, otherwise you will not be trusted. These are also some principles, and I think the Vatican is trying its best to, to integrate these principles. But we haven't seen the end of it yet. So two final remarks. Taking Vatican II seriously. If you read the Apostolic Exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis, he speaks about time before space. And as a canon lawyer, I puzzle with this thing, how, how can we introduce this in canon law? If I, as I try to translate this, it's about the new balance between the doctrinal content of the Catholic faith and, on the other hand, the way it is put into practice. The means of communication, consultation, consensus have to find new relevance in the application in ecclesiastical governance structures. In his letter to the people of God, 2018, Pope Francis challenged the church to overcome the disease of clericalism. I hope you remember that. And I think that this is also what he wants. The task of the clergy is not to bring the flock to green pastures, abundant pastures, but to engage all talents present in the flock to find a new way of traveling together. In the traveling together, we find good pastures. It's not so much about the pastures, but the traveling together, that we are going together, is already a good thing to discover. So, my conclusion. So there is a future of canon law and of canon lawyers in the church. The objective of canon law is not to strengthen ecclesiastical structures in order to maintain the independence and apartheid from secular society, but to make the church community a reliable and credible player in society. 
participation in society strengthens her to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in all relevant sectors of society, be it in ethics, be it in social welfare, but also in economics and in environmental issues. If the Church of Christ is, according to Lumen Gentium, sacrament of salvation for the world, can a law can deliver a contribution in translating synodal elements of her own tradition and also governance principles of today's, today's society into a credible leadership in the Catholic Church. And this leadership will help the Catholic Church to respond to the high calling to serve humanity and creation altogether. As we consider the positive resonance of the encyclical Laudato Si, we must be aware of the fact that even secular society is longing for inspiration and encouragement. Even if modern citizens do not always agree with Christian doctrine and Catholic doctrine, Catholics in the Catholic Church might be recognized as valuable partners in this permanent encounter in society. The Church doesn't need to resign completely her ancient title and function of Magistra Mundi, but she's called to enter in dialogue with society, asking modern citizens the very same question by which Christ addressed his first disciples, and also after his resurrection, Mary Magdalene. You know his first questions. What are you looking for? And to Mary Magdalene, whom are you looking for? It is the same word that is used by him in this entrance of this new era. As long as the Catholic Church knows how to resound this interrogation of Christ, she will respond to a calling that she has fulfilled for ages in different times and circumstances, always concerned about the care of the souls. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.